Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning is the Old Testament reading for the day, taken from Daniel chapter 6. I read just verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that he, the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room with the windows open toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. In the name of our Savior, dear children of God. The text that is before us this morning is one that I am sure is very familiar to each one of you. It seems that Daniel Lyons' den is a Old Testament Bible story that we learn at a very young age, whether it's Sunday school or on the lap of our mother or father. <coughs> and because we know it so well, it becomes one that people many times say is one of their favorites in the Bible. But it's a really overall simple story. A man is in a situation where he can either confess his faith, that he believes in God and trusts in God and, and suffer the circumstances, or he can cover up his faith in a way, deny that he believes, and ease on through life. I think it's important to understand that Daniel had those choices. When the king made his decree that everyone now for 30 days should pray to me, Daniel could have said, well, oh, okay. <coughs> Gone along with the situation, maybe come up with a, a really fine-sounding excuse for the people around him, and people would have probably accepted it and probably said, well, it's, it's Daniel, it must be okay. Or he could have stopped praying altogether, just done nothing and, and maybe backed away from the situation. Some might think that would have been a smart thing to do. Or he could have maybe been a little bit more secretive about his praying, not sit there in front of an open window, not doing on a regular basis when everybody knows where Daniel is. But then again, that would have given the impression that he had stopped praying altogether also. See, Daniel had options. He could have done other things than what he did. But Daniel looked at the situation and didn't see any options. He knew what he had to do solely because he knew God. He knew the first commandment. He knew what, what God wanted him to do, and, and because of all the promises of God, because of all that God had done for him, because of his love for God, Daniel saw no other option. <coughs> he was going to continue on in life just as he had before. He was going to keep his relationship with God. He was going to pray, not to the king, but to God, and suffer whatever circumstances, whatever consequences would come his way. You all know what happened. Thrown in the lion's den, but God was with him. And the next morning he's pulled out of the lion's den and there's not a mark on his body. 500 years ago, a monk named Martin Luther walked up to a Catholic church door and nailed onto that door 95 theses. He didn't have to. He could have looked at the indulgences and said, well, who cares? It's not that big of a deal. Oh, he could have gotten angry and, and maybe dealt with it by himself and said, well, I'm going to study the scriptures, but I'm, I'm not going to share them with anybody else because... It doesn't make any difference anyway. The church is too powerful. He had options. But then again, he didn't. He knew what God wanted him to do. He knew the Word of God. And in his study of the Word of God, we find him four years later standing in front of the, uh, the diet at Warren's. And people looking at him and saying, now you must take back 
everything that you wrote, everything that you said. And as he stood there, he had options. He could have said, sure, all right, I understand. Not a good time, not a good place, uh, I'll stop, I won't write anymore. Or he could have said, okay, I'll do what you say and, and wait till he gets back to Wittenberg and then continue on what he was doing. But Luther didn't see those options. Again, motivated by God and all that he knew God had done for him as he studied the Word of God, Luther saw there was what, one option he had, and that's to stand there in front of the emperor, one of the most powerful men in the world. All the electors, cardinals, many other very important people in the kingdom. And say this, unless I am convinced that by the testimony of the Holy, Spirit, Holy Scriptures or evident reason, I am neither able nor willing to recant, since it is neither safe nor right to act against conscience. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. He couldn't. He saw no other option other than to say, I can't take it back. And he suffered the consequences. They declared him a heretic, which meant anybody could kill him at any time. But really no different than Daniel, God was with him. For on, on the way back to Wittenberg, he was secretly hijacked and taken off to Wartburg Castle. There kept for about a year, kept safe, till finally he couldn't stand it anymore and he had to go back. Living, living the rest of his life underneath that ban. Anybody could kill him at any time. And yet, you know, he died probably from a heart attack many years later. <coughs> you and I aren't under the threat of being thrown into the lion's den. And you and I aren't under the ban where anybody can kill us at any time with with no punishment. And yet we too find ourselves in this very familiar situation quite often where we have a choice to make. We have options. We can confess our faith openly before the people around us and suffer the circumstances or the consequences. Or we can be quiet. We can change and ease on through life. <coughs> Those situations show themselves in, in many aspects of our life and in many of our relationships. They show themselves in our own families sometimes. Somebody related to us, very close to us, decides that they are no longer going to go to church, that church is for somebody else, not them. They are going to enjoy other things on a Sunday morning, a Thursday night and they will no longer go. Or one of our children decides that they are now going to listen to the world and they are going to move in with their girlfriend or their boyfriend because everybody is doing it anyway. Or we know of people who are abusing alcohol, abusing drugs, abusing other people physically, abusing people sexually, and what do we do about it? Do we speak up? Do we talk to them as a Christian? Do we say that's wrong? Do we point them to Jesus? Or do we be quiet and ease on through life? Situations also appear within our neighborhoods, within our friends. We know people who, who don't know Jesus is their savior from sin. They, they really have no church affiliation. They, they never go to church, and yet 
somebody should say something to them and ask them to come along. Maybe we're hanging around a group of friends who, who are living very coarse and unchristian lives. And they're proud of it, boast about it. Or maybe we have people around us who are more than willing to mock God, to say things about God that just aren't true. And in all those situations, God wants us to speak up. To say something. And yet we don't want to seem strange. We don't want to set somebody in opposition to ourselves. And so, again, we be quiet and we ease on through life. Sometimes it's a very personal opposition. It's we are inundated with all the things that come at us around our world, the things we read, the things we hear. We sometimes have to ask ourselves, do we still believe and confess that there is but one God and, and that is the God of the Bible? Do we still believe and confess that there is but one Savior and His name is Jesus who has lived and died and paid for my sins, the sins of an entire world, and He is the only way to heaven? Is there still a right and wrong in our world? Is there still something called a, a moral life? Is homosexuality, abortion, divorce... The list goes on and on. Are, are those things still wrong? Or are we willing to say they're wrong and not just say they're wrong, but live a life that says they're wrong? Or would we rather blend in with the world? Speak as they speak. Are quiet as they are quiet. And he's on through life. See, in this Reformation Day, it gives us a chance to search our own hearts and ask ourselves, would I stand next to Daniel? Would, would I still stand next to a man called Martin Luther? Am I still willing to make this, the same confession as many, many, many Christians have made in the years before I was even alive? And to say to our world, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. God help me. You can. You can, I'm not going to say, now you go home and you try harder. That won't work. See, the only way any of us, the only way Daniel could do this and stand, the only way Martin Luther could do this and stand, the only way any of us could ever stand against our world and all the things going on around us is by the help of God. And he does help you. He promises you that through his word, through the Lord's Supper, through the sacrament, he, through the gospel, will continue to strengthen and build your faith. A faith that has but one object, and that is Jesus as our Savior from sin. A faith that grabs onto the word of God and says, this is my salvation, this is my God who loves me, I am going to follow him. See, as we celebrate the, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we dare not look at it and say, oh, that was a wonderful thing he did. And look back on it as a, a period in history that is in history, and we just leave it there, and we remember it once a year. No, it gives us a chance to look at our own lives and our own confessions. And as we look at those, the first thing we all need to do is to stand before God and repent. 
And say, yes, Father, there are many times in my life where, where I don't say what I should say. I don't stand where I should stand. And I don't confess when I should confess. Dear Father, help me. And his answer to you is, by all means, yes. Stay close to him. Continue to stay in his word, study his word. Continue to take the Lord's Supper before, because before those means of grace, as he works in your heart, he will strengthen you. He will help you. As we heard Jesus tell us that God will give you the words to say. God will give you the things to do. And he will help you stand. He will help you continue to confess your faith before a world that many times will stand against you. But to remember that as you stand with God, you stand with the one who has already defeated the world, defeated the devil, defeated your sinful flesh. A God who promises you eternal life. So stay close to Him. And strengthened by Him. Confess to the world, I am a Christian. I believe what God says in His Word. I can do nothing else. Amen.